Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part two of my series on the selected gross pathology of the cardiovascular system, in which we're going to talk about developmental diseases of the heart and blood vessels. But before I do that, as I do in all of my lectures, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who have provided me these fantastic images, which allow me to put these lectures together. Well, let's start with a dog. This is probably a small breed dog. Maybe it's a toy poodle or some sort of small terrier. And you can see that there is a connection between the base of the pulmonary artery and the aorta, which shouldn't be there. This is known as a persistent ductus arteriosum. This is a vessel that should shut along with the frame and ovale at birth. And if it remains patent, you end up with left to right shunting, and then eventually right to left shunting. We'll talk about that in just a minute with patent ductus arteriosus. Now, if it shuts down, it becomes a small non-patent ligamentum structure, structure called the ligamentum arteriosum. And we're going to talk about problems with the ligamentum arteriosum in just a minute. Patent ductus arteriosus is the most common defect in dogs, although we see it in other species. And when we talk about dogs, uh, aortic and pulmonary stenosis are number two and number three in line, and we'll look at those as well. Uh, with this particular condition, females are predisposed. Now, when you think about the pressure dynamic in the heart, in the fetus, um, there is no pressure difference between the two vessels. It's only at birth when you have the closure of the foramen ovale that you have a significant pressure differential between the right and the left heart. So usually in all of these defects, you don't see any significant changes in the fetus until it's born. Now, what happens is initially when you have this shunt because the pressure is much higher in the left ventricle, the blood will push back from the aorta into the right ventricle. That's a left to right shunt. Before long, the pressure in the right ventricle will be so high, it will push as much of the blood into the lung as possible, and then you'll get pulmonary hypertension, and then you will get such high pressure in the right ventricle, it actually reverses itself to become a right to left shunt. And you see animals which very commonly have pronounced right ventricular dilatation, pulmonary hypertension, and ultimately volume overload of the left heart as well because of that right to left shunt. See, these are classic for PDAs in the dog. Now, when you see this bulge here, the normal heart should be fairly straight. When you see this bulge out here, you always want to think about right ventricular dilatation or right ventricular hypertrophy, which usually precedes that. It's a classic change, which tells you there's something going on with the right heart. Usually, it is pushing against extra tension in the form of either too much blood in the lungs and pulmonary hypertension or a stenosis at the base of the pulmonary artery, which we'll look at in just a minute. As I said before, PDAs are not just a problem that's associated with dogs. Here is one in a horse, um, but I've never f physically uh, and personally seen one, so I can't tell you much about them in species other than dogs. Now, we talked about pulmonic stenosis, or a narrowing of the pulmonary artery, and here we see a fibrous band at the base of the pulmonary artery. And this is how mo most of stenoses appear. You get a combination of thickening of the muscle of the right side of the heart and this fibrous band, which actually draws down and partially occludes the opening of the pulmonary vessel. So the heart, because it has to push harder to get blood into the lungs, the walls will initially become thicker, so you'll have right ventricular hypertrophy before eventually it wears out, and you get a thin wall, and 
right ventricular dilatation. So initially you get hypertrophy, eventually it just gets worn out and you get right ventricular dilatation. Here's a great case from Dr. Raquel Rech from Texas A&M of left ventricular hypertrophy due to aortic stenosis. Look right here. You can see that fibrous band at the base of the aorta. So the left heart has worked harder to push blood into the aorta so you'll get initial hypertrophy of the wall before you get failure. This subaortic stenotic ring is one of the most common findings that you will see in all animal species. Oftentimes if you look for it, you'll find it. It usually causes absolutely no problem. But at the base of the aorta, just for, look for this fibrous connective tissue. And you can often find it in an animal with no clinical findings. Here's another one in a dog. Okay, here it is at the base of the heart, this little fibrous ring. And then you can see the marked left ventricular hypertrophy. This is a case of aortic stenosis, the second most common congenital lesion in the dog. Let's look at another common congenital lesion which involves abnormal development of the large blood vessels of the chest. Not all of them affect the heart, some affect the blood vessels, and this is a fairly common one that you'll see in the dog, rarely in other species. And here's our friend, the ligamentum arteriosum. We talked about it when we talked about patent ductus arteriosus, when there's blood going through. Well, this one shut down pretty well, okay? It's just a fibrous band, okay? And it connects the pulmonary artery with the aorta. Okay, but the problem that we see with the ligamentum arteriosum is in a condition which goes by the name of a persistent right aortic arch, which tells you a little bit about the embryologic problem here, or as I like to call it, a vascular ring anomaly. I think that that's a better name for it because then you don't have to explain it to people. But since I mentioned persistent right aortic arch, I'm sort of sort of hemmed in here to explaining how that works. Now, I want you to pretend that you're holding a dog's head in your hands and it's looking at you so we can get oriented. So we're looking toward the back of the dog. Now, normally, development of the aorta, there are two aortic arches during development. And the one on the right usually withers and goes away. You only get one aorta, and usually it's the left aortic arch. So if we're looking toward the back of the dog, okay, when the aorta comes out of the heart, it's going to go down the left side of the esophagus toward the back of the dog. That is normal. That is the side you have ligamentum arteriosum. That is the side that the pulmonary vessels come in. That's exactly where it should be. The problem is when that acts accidentally involutes and you have a the right aortic arch, which is the one that develops into the aorta, okay? And what happens is that pulls everything up to the right, okay? Normally the ligamentum aorta, a, uh, arteriosum is right down here with the pulmonary artery. It's just a little flabby. There's no tension on it, okay? If the aorta is coming down the left side, it's coming down the right side, it pulls everything up to the other side. And this ligamentum arteriosum forms a fibrous constriction over the top of the esophagus. Okay, so you have three vessels causing this vascular ring anomaly, the aorta, the pulmonary arteriosum, and this, uh, this pulmonary artery and the ligamentum arteriosum it stretches over the esophagus, flattening it, and you get a condition known as megasophagus. Okay. The food simply cannot pass this constriction here. The rest of the esophagus is good, okay? There are two forms of megasophagus. Uh, we go back to the lectures on the GI tract. We've already talked about this, but you have the ones that are caused by these vascular ring anomalies, anomalies which is simply a form of stricture. Then in the dog, you have a number of conditions uh, like myasthenia gravis or lead toxicity or polymyositis, which cause a full length a problem with a dilated esophagus.
Here it's only dilated proximal to the base of the heart. So hopefully now you understand why people say persistent right aortic arch. I like vascular ring anomaly and you sort of understand how it all fits together. Okay, so we looked at the three most common uh, problems in, uh, in the dog. We've looked at the vascular ring anomaly. I'm going to skip cats. Cats, they have these problems. Most of their problems are valvular dysplasias. They don't show up real well. You open up a cat's heart and the valves just look sort of funny. Um, so they get a lot of tricuspid mitral valve dysplasias as the most common abnormalities. But if we move into large animals, and here's a great one, and the most common uh, defects that you will see in most of our production animals and horses are septal defects. We're looking at a calf. This is a very large ventricular septal defect. And remember, there's no deleterious effects on the fetus um, because all the oxygenated blood is provided by the mother. So it's going to grow just fine. The problem is when it's on its own. And I don't want to say that all animals with septal defects are going to die. Some are very small. Some, even in the horse, have been shown to heal themselves. It depends often on the size of the defect, sometimes on the location. This is the most common site that you will see for ventricular septal defects, and they are high up under the uh, cusp of the aortic valve. Sometimes we will see them lower here between the bases of the ventricle, but most of the time we see them up impinging on the great vessels or what we call the perimembranous portion of the septum. Uh, in, a, in an old retrospective study of uh, almost 2,300 calves with congenital abnormalities, cardiac malformations occurred in 3% of the cases, and this was the most common in bovine neonates. And, and the problem is that these animals are not going to be good. Remember, it's always weight gain for beef calves, milk production, and they are just not going to be able to keep up with their uh, siblings in terms of meat or milk production. It, in the horse, here's one very same spot. In the horse, we can see some other changes going on. Um, which is fibro, fibrosis of the endocardium. Some people say it's fibroelastosis of the endocardium, and it's just the endocardium's response to a lot of turbulence. You can imagine the turbulent flow where every time this heart beats, um, it's going to push blood because the contraction of the left side is so much higher than the contraction of the right side. It's going to push blood into the right side. The first thing you're going to see in almost all of these is right-sided hypertrophy and pretty quickly moving into failure. So you may see pulmonary hypertension um, and almost all of these as we saw before with the, with the PDA almost all these start out as a left to right shunt because that left heart is so much stronger than the right but the blood, the right side of the heart is going to push all of that blood into the lungs, and eventually it's going to fill the lungs up. It's going to put way too much blood in the lung than it should. These animals, like the PDA animals, will develop pulmonary hypertension as a result. Okay, um, so we've looked at ventricular septal defects. We talked a little bit about the uh, the dynamics. I do want to show you one in a dog and it's a very small one and it's most commonly seen in English Bulldogs and Keesons and, and this when you see a ventricular septal defect it's very important not to stop there. So many of them are components of more complex defects. We're going to look at some in a minute, um, but you always want to look f at the vessels. You want to look for those stenotic rings, especially pulmonic stenosis, which with ventral septal defect, 
should make you think about things like Eisenmenger complexes and potentially tetralogy of Fallot, something I always found very confusing. And hopefully I'll be able to explain it a little better to you. Um, look how small this defect is. This is an animal that probably, if it's an English bulldog, um, you may not know and it may get well into its life because it's, English bulldogs aren't going to be athletes. These animals are never athletes. But, you know, their, their life um, is so slow anyhow. You might not notice it for years. Obviously, if someone put a stethoscope on this animal, probably going to pick up some form of murmur or thrill. But uh, not every ventricular septal defect in any species is going to be the death of every animal that has it. Here's one in a pig. Once again, high, usually in the perimembranous reason, but just a ventricular uh, septal defect in pigs. They run a little higher. Almost 5% of pigs have cardiac defects when examined, but many of them, uh, they're small enough that they can go ahead. They may be somewhat smaller than their siblings, but uh, it generally is not considered a major economic problem in the swine production industry. Another great picture by Raquel Rich. And just to remind me, this is an alpaca. And alpacas have so, and, and camelids in general, have so many problems um, with congenital defects, not just of the heart, but of the, the musculoskeletal system. I once sat through a wonderful two-hour lecture on diseases of camelids, and, and literally the first hour and a half were all the congenital defects. So I think if you're a, if you're a baby llama or a baby alpaca, and you get through the first day of life, you're in pretty good shape. But they do get a lot, and, and ventricular septal defects are commonly seen in them as well. I just want to show you the, the, how much fibrosis you can get in some of these animals that live for a while. Um, this is the left heart. The wall is pretty thin, so this animal probably went through the, uh, uh, the combination of hypertrophy and then failure, but look at the amount of fibrous connective tissue underneath the endocardium trying to stabilize that heart and reacting to turbulence. So this is another sort of uh, concomitant finding that you often see in these non-life-threatening ventricular septal defects, extensive fibrous or fibroelastosis of the endocardium. Okay. I promised that I would talk for a moment about the Tetralogy of Fallot, and everybody hates to talk about the Tetralogy of Fallot because nobody can remember all the four things that make it. And I have to actually show you two or three different pictures to show you all of them. This is a great picture from Dr. Derek Mosier. And here is the first thing that you're going to see from the outside. Left side of the heart, and then, boop, we have this big bulge from the right side. Remember I said if you see a bulge here, it should be sort of, you know, conical, but you see a bulge here, you want to think there is right ventricular damage, either hypertrophy, or in this case, I think we could probably agree, because someone's poked it on, the, that this is probably dilatation. Look how round this part. There's no point to the heart. So this suggests there is actually biventricular dilatation. So number one, in Tetralogy for Low is going to be right ventricular hypertrophy slash dilatation. That's number one. Why do we have that? We have that because we have pulmonic stenosis. Okay, we have pulmonic stenosis, and it's hard for that right heart to push blood into the, into the pul pulmonary artery. So that's number two. Right ventricular hypertrophy and pulmonic stenosis. Now it gets worse. Okay, in cases of tetralogy of Fallot, often you will see blood flow from both the 
right and left ventricles goes into the aorta. Okay, that's what people call the overriding aorta, and that was that one always confused me. It's not overriding any of the other vessels in the in the chest. It is overriding the limit of the left ventricle to take blood from both ventricles at once. So what's happening is a lot of unoxygenated blood is getting pushed into the systemic circulation by that right ventricle. Up to 40% of its outflow may be going into the aorta. And these animals are seriously hypoxemic. Um, it was shown in, uh, uh, in people that uh, children with tetralogy of Fallot, when they get excited, they faint um, because their heart rate goes up and the, more, the faster their heart beats, the more unoxygenated blood is going into the systemic circulation from the right ventricle as well. And so their blood oxygen level just absolutely plummets. Okay, so, so that's number three, the overriding aorta. This one is really bad. It's a great picture by Dr. Rory Chen where actually you can hardly tell the difference between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. It's known as the pseudotruncus arteriosus, and that's another version, you know, another, another flavor of tetralogy of Fallot. Okay, so we've got right ventricular hyperplasia, pulmonic stenosis, look for that little fibrous band, or maybe it's a developmental abnormality that the lumen, such as we see here, is much smaller than you would expect. And then the final thing is our old friend, the ventricular septal defect. And we've looked at lots of those that always is in here as well, causing pressure problems, causing pulmonary hypertension, and those are the four things. But I think it's that overriding aorta that people get confused about. Just remember, the overriding aorta is taking blood from both ventricles at once. Okay, we covered all the holes in the hearts and everything associated with the development of the heart. What about some abnormal placements? This is one you're not gonna miss too much. Okay, this is known as ectopia cordis. You can see it in any species. It's seen in people, it's seen in dogs. It is most commonly seen in ruminants, especially calves, and you can see it in two different places. It is not a defect of the heart. The heart is absolutely fine. It's a defect of either the ribs, well, basically it's def defect of the ribs and the sternum, or this is called ectopia sternalis when it pops out through the sternum, or it can pop out in the neck. Talk about having your heart in your throat, okay? And that's what happens. Another defect of the proximal part of the rib cage, oops, and that heart ends up in the throat. Sometimes you can even find them in the abdomen. Just remember, it's not a malformation of the heart, it's a malformation of the external structures uh, surrounding the heart, but I put it in this lecture because it seems to fit. Remember I said that you could see it in any species. Here we have it in a piglet. Once again, ectopia cordis is perfectly fine. If you want to call it ectopia cordis sternalis, that would be great too. Looks like the animal has a lot of anasarca as well. Maybe it was laying on its heart and had bad flow problems. Okay, we're almost done with this lecture. Um, we, but we are done with the heart congenital defects. I just want to mention congenital defects of the blood vessels. And, and uh, there aren't a lot that are very photogenic, but there are a couple that are associated with the lymphatic system that we might as well talk about in this lecture. And here's one that is called congenital lymphedema, and it's often seen in Ayrshire calves. It's also seen in Angus calves, rarely in Holsteins, but Ayrshire seem to be predisposed to this. It's a disease that's also seen in people as be, been genetically linked to a deficiency in podoplanin. Podoplanin is a gene product, it's a protein that has major responsibilities in the development of the lymphatic system, both the vessels and the lymph nodes themselves. It doesn't stock them with inflammatory cells, that's a lot of other genes, but the development of the structures known as lymph nodes is under the rule of podoplanin. And when you have deficiencies in production, there are all types of uh, 
of forms, and depending on the, the severity of the deficiency is what you will see. Severely deficient animals come out with tremendous anasarca. They're all swollen up like big balloons or the Michelin Man, and they don't live very long. Animals that have lesser and, and those Michelin men, I forgot to mention, you can't find lymph nodes in them. They didn't develop either. The lymphatics don't develop or the lymph nodes. Animals like this with a lesser deficiency of podoplanin will, will uh, live for a while. They tend, because the, uh, the most affected lymphatics are the ones on the ventrum of the animal in the legs, and here along the, uh, the mandible, they tend to have massive edema there. You'll find lymph nodes, and you will see a a variation in development, but the the lymphatics on the extremities and on the underlying underlying parts of the animal tend to accumulate a lot of fluid here. So this is congenital lymphedema, podoplanin, podoplanin deficiency in cattle. And then I want to mention one more: a congenital defect. Um, and it's thought to be a congenital defect of elastin production in large draft breeds, including Shires and Belgians and Clydesdales and, and Gypsies uh, and even Frisians. And this is a, a great disease that has been written up within the last uh, 10 years by Dr. Verena Affolter at the uh, uh, University of California, Davis. This picture I got from Dr. Ingeborg Langor. It's a wonderful picture demonstrating an advanced case of chronic progressive lymphedema in draft horses. And usually, when they're foals, you don't see any any change. But be, the, their legs, the backs of their legs, become progressively more swollen due to chronic edema, and a defect probably in the elastin within the lymph vessels. Although it totally hasn't been proven yet, but everything's pointing to that. And you have this this chronic edema and it starts out by swelling of the hind limbs and because everybody wants their Clydesdales with these big feathers uh, people don't notice the secondary bacterial infections that often come along with the disease there may be bacterial infections um, scratches and grease heel in the lay lay terminology or infection by various mites like Coreoptes and when you see that in one of these draft horses you want to think could we be dealing with this chronic progressive lymphedema? And then unfortunately, as a disease progresses, you get tremendous fibrosis and almost these golf ball sized uh, accumulations, nodular accumulations of fibrous connective tissue uh, in the skin of the uh, back of the legs. And obviously this animal is not going to be able to perform with this type of deformity. So there's a progressive disease. As the animals get older, it resembles a disease in humans called elephantiasis, Veruca nostra. And, uh, and it has to do, elephantiasis is, in people is usually thought to be due to a parasite infection of lymphatics, preventing proper function. This is a genetic problem here in a horse with elastin deficiencies or abnormalities preventing proper function of draining lymphatics. Okay, well that covers, uh, that covers the congenital abnormalities of the cardiovascular system, or at least to the depth that I'm going to go with it. Um, there are a lot more congenital deficiencies. People who love them and can explain them better than I, but I hope I gave you a little bit of an insight into some of these more common ones. Our next lecture, we're going to start with the infectious diseases, and we're going to start with viral infections of the heart. So I look forward to, uh, to tuning back in for that one. Make sure to keep coming back to the JPC's uh, video library or the foundation's YouTube channel, a Facebook page, wherever you're watching these videos, and uh, I hope you're enjoying listening to them as much as I'm enjoying the, uh, recording them. So, everybody, have a fantastic day.